Today we're going to be talking about a really interesting character. As soon as I started researching, I've just loved everything about him and his whole vibe and his eccentric personality. There's just so many cool things about him. He just had the soul of an adventurer. He was curious, quirky, eccentric, super innovative. He was an inventor and really loved by all his friends and family. He was absolutely obsessed with hot air balloons. In fact, that's kind of an understatement. He lived and he breathed everything to do with hot air balloons. But in 2021, a bizarre accident took him from his friends, family, and the hot air balloon world. This is the story of Brian Boland. Hot air ballooning is one of the oldest forms of flight. It goes back, way back to the 18th century. The first untethered piloted hot air balloon was launched in November of 1783. The balloon is a simple flying system. It has that nylon envelope or the balloon itself, a propane burner system that heats up the air inside the envelope and makes it rise. And then there's the basket. The envelope is that huge bag of heated air, which comes from an open flame that's usually powered by liquid propane. And because the air in the bag is less dense than the air outside it, that makes it achieve buoyancy. And below the bag is a wicker basket that's kind of synonymous with balloons that carries the passengers. It's actually considered one of the safest forms of aviation. But like any other thing you do in life, really, there's risks associated with it. Since 1983, there's been 431 accidents involving serious injuries, 52 of which resulted in fatalities, according to the National Transportation Safety Board. So I'm sure you can guess a few of those risks associated with hot air balloons. Faulty equipment, falling out of the balloon, colliding with high voltage power lines, getting caught in winds, losing control in flight, and one that I was lucky enough to experience, excessive speed upon landing. A little side story, many years ago, I was in a balloon myself with my dad, who got it to, for me as a gift. And so we had this beautiful flight over the beautiful landscape, a sunny summer day, and then we came down to land. And I tell you, that wind was a flying, and we were, we had excessive speed as we came in. We were landing in this big farmer's field, and um, we were going like sideways on it. We weren't coming down. I was envisioning a nice little landing like Mary Poppins coming down with her umbrella, landing gently and easily and safely. But no, we came careening in at 100 miles an hour, what it seemed like, and hit the ground and kind of skidded along the ground. I got turfed out of the balloon or the basket, and then my dad got turfed out of the basket. The balloon kept going, leaving this trail of bodies behind it. And then it finally came to a stop with the pilot who was luckily still inside. So we weren't injured or anything. We had a few bumps and bruises and I was terrified after that. I never wanted to go on another hot air balloon ride because it was so terrifying landing like that. But once I started reading about today's subject of the story, Brian Boland, he's probably the only person I would have gone up in a balloon with because he was just so well versed in how to drive. <laughs> He had many, many years of experience and was quite, quite good at flying hot air balloons. So I'd probably go up and one with him. So Brian Boland was known locally around Vermont as the balloon man. He was this bearded six foot four guy. He was an artist, a visionary, and he always wore his trademark fisherman's cap. He had a booming voice that could be heard hundreds of feet in the air. He first got interested in hot air balloons when he was a graduate student in the 1970s. He had a deadline that was coming up for his master's thesis and he had to decide what he was going to do it on, but he was just scrambling for ideas because he didn't really know what he wanted to do it on. And then he came across his Sports Illustrated article on hot air ballooning and he was hooked. He had this curious creative mind and was totally excited by the possibility of ballooning and everything surrounding ballooning. He spent the next eight months designing and sewing a balloon. When he finished, he inflated and tethered the balloon on campus, calling it a sculpture. Later, he followed that artistic journey and became an art and photography teacher. 
He taught students how to fabricate balloons, paint them, and even weave the wicker baskets. He transformed his house into a design center and manufacturing studio. He even soaked the wicker in the bathtub, which I'm sure his family just loved. In 1974, he attached a three-wheeled bubble car to a balloon. It was a functioning car that actually drove, and he attached it to the bottom of the balloon, launched the balloon in the air, went for his flight, landed, packed up the balloon into the car, and drove home. And true to his unconventional nature, Brian's teaching kind of followed the same style. His former student said one day he'd bring a sewing machine in for a project, and the next day he'd whisk us off to New York City to take photographs. He was always getting into trouble with the administration. In another incident, Brian was arrested for landing on the roof of a bakery. <laughs> a school official had to come and bail him out. So he left teaching in the late 1970s to focus on ballooning, and soon after that he made it his livelihood. He flew, he piloted balloons, he wrote about ballooning, and he just kept designing and creating balloons. He built over 150 of them. He said once, when we're all done and everybody goes home at the end of the day and they go to sleep, I sit up lying awake thinking of balloons and how to design new things for balloons. This isn't just a temporary thing. This is like 44 plus years of having this obsession. And Brian still holds the record for altitude reach in a hot air ship when he took off from France to Luxembourg, and he reached a height of 16,200 feet. He also had 27 world records in small balloons for altitude, distance, and duration. True to his eclectic nature, Brian was also known to skip those traditional competitions and go for the more, let's say, quirky competitions. One of them was a contest in Ireland to see who could land near a pub bring a pint of Guinness back to the starting line and land without spilling a drop. Now that sounds like my kind of contest. In 1982, a film crew followed him and he made his first, the first ever ascent up the face of the world's tallest waterfall, 3,000 foot Angel Falls in Venezuela. It was quite the feat and there's a documentary on it on Vimeo that I've linked below. Check it out because it's really a wild story. This is my balloon museum, but some people call it Brian's Museum of Rusty Dusty Stuff. <laughs> and no surprise, Brian also had a museum. He called his museum Brian's Museum for the Experimental Balloon and Airship Association, but others just called it Brian's Museum of Rusty Dusty Stuff. And everything in it had a balloon-related story. A lot of the things were things that he actually found while he was up in the air ballooning. And he found seven fire trucks while ballooning. I got uh, seven fire trucks and I don't even think of myself as a collector of fire trucks. It's just, I found seven fire trucks from balloons. He had the largest collection of balloon envelopes, which was over 140 of them. And that's the largest collection of envelopes in a single place. But most of all, he just loved sharing his love of balloons with others. And he could often be seen taking people up around his home. After every ride, he broke out a bottle of champagne to have a toast to another successful flight. He also once landed in a field where a woman was having her 80th birthday and he talked her into going up for a ride with him. Brian was just one of those people who couldn't sit still either. He was always creating or inventing something. In an interview on YouTube that was really good, I linked it below, he talked about the time in, that there was a lull in his life. He was just kind of, things were a little bit slow and he was looking for a new project. So he decided that he wanted to build a super efficient three-wheeled vehicle with super high mileage, like 100 miles per gallon, because why not? <laughs> no surprise to his friends and family, but Brian made that vehicle and also ended up building 29 more of them. That's right, 29. He had 30 of them all together, and he couldn't part with any of them because they were like art forms to him. And my favorite invention of him was the canoe car. He said, it's a canoe on wheels that motors down the road to the boat ramp. So you go flying down the road, the ramp, and you slam on the brakes at the edge of the water and the canoe then slams forward into the water. And it has two electric trolling motors on it so you don't even have to paddle. And of course, because he liked to have many things, he built 12 more of those <laughs> canoe cars. He also had motorized picnic tables and barbecues. And I think if you'd name it, he had it. He had a building fall down one year and he saw the wood sitting on the ground later and said, I think I'm seeing a dinosaur. And so he saw it as a future dinosaur and he wanted it to be a tribute to his son who had his only child who had died when he was mountain biking in the 1990s. 
So Brian had a big party and invited people to come over and there was over a hundred people who came out and helped build this wooden brontosaurus. And it's still there today and they call it the Vermontosaurus. Then on July 15, 2021, the hot air balloon world changed forever. Brian and four passengers took off in his hot air balloon from his home. Conditions were ideal, the winds were moderate, visibility was at 10 miles, and the daylight was just this beautiful golden hue later in the day. The passengers were Emily, who was in her 30s, her parents, and her 10-year-old daughter. They were locals who knew Brian, but they had never flown with him before. In fact, Emily and her daughter had never been in a hot air balloon before. And Emily's parents had been, but not with Brian. And as he took off, Emily could see that Brian was super confident and he knew what he was doing in the basket. He was getting them up and giving them directions and, and giving them a little tour of the area. And around the 30 minute mark, Brian made his radio call to their chase driver just to let him know where they were going to be. He then disconnected the fuel line from an empty propane tank to attach it to a full one. And Emily noticed around that time he started patting his pockets and kind of rushing around the basket. She wasn't really sure what was going on. And then the balloon started kind of accelerating towards the ground. At this point, Brian started to look panicked and was kind of moving faster around the basket, searching for something. Then he told them that the burner's pilot light went out and he needed a striker to reignite it. As he searched, the balloon just kept plunging towards the ground faster and faster. And there were moments from hitting the ground when Brian finally found a striker in a plastic bag. He ripped it open with his teeth and to get at the backup striker, he lit it and he was able to light the pilot lights and then a flame appeared much to everyone's relief. Brian gave it some gas and the burner just roared as the heat flooded into the massive envelope. But they were still descending at an at a pace that they couldn't get going back up fast enough. So Brian said, bend your knees, we're gonna bounce right back up. So they hit a field, but the quick rebound that Brian predicted didn't happen. Instead, the jolt of the impact tipped the basket over and sent both Brian and Emily's mother out of it. Then, before they knew it, the balloon suddenly lifted again and it started ascending really fast and Emily realized that her, her dad and her daughter were alone in the basket. She had no idea what to do and Brian was no longer in the basket. Emily, realizing they were in a lot of danger, slowly looked over the basket's side. She was confused when she saw a brown shoe wedged into a strap that held one of the propane tanks outside the basket. She realized that it was Brian's shoe and thought that it must have come off when he got thrown out of the balloon. Then she heard his voice. Emily realized that Brian was attached to that shoe. He had one foot wedged in and another hand barely gripping this small handle that was used to carry the basket. His other arm and leg were dangling free over a thousand feet of the Vermont landscape. Brian was in obvious danger and Emily's a former EMT, so her mind immediately went to how to keep him safe and keep him alive. She was wondering how they could hoist him up and then she saw a drop line that was used for the ground crew that she could throw down to him. So she told him that we need to get you in the basket. But to her astonishment, Brian yelled back, just leave me here, just leave me here. Emily couldn't believe it. She kept repeating herself and he just kept refusing the help. She started pleading with him to take the rope and he just kept refusing. Emily's mind was racing and she knew they needed to save him. They needed to save him because he needed to save their lives. They didn't know what the heck they were doing in that basket. Then incredibly, he started yelling out instructions. He told them there were two landing options, the water or a field, both of which were terrifying to Emily. So they tried to follow Brian's commands and Emily's dad gave the balloon the gas heated air and then let it float then gave it more air. But no matter what, those balloons just go where the wind goes and you can't steer them. The light was starting to fade and Emily and her daughter were, and father were almost shaking with fright at this point. 10 minutes of Brian hanging below his instructions stopped. Emily looked over the side and he was still there. He looked up at her and he whispered, I can't hold on much longer. By this time he'd gotten his foot unstuck, but he was hanging on with both of his hands now. Emily kept the drop line close, hoping that Brian would change his mind and let her throw it to him, but he didn't. They were nearing the edge of the river when she heard him say, oh shit. She felt the release of Brian's weight before she saw him fall. 
Emily didn't know how high they were, but she knew it would be near impossible to survive from that height. They crossed over some power lines, thank goodness, and they headed towards a stand of poplar trees. Emily's dad blasted the heat for a solid 10 seconds, hoping to gain enough lift to go over those trees, but it was too late. The balloon had a mind of its own, but amid those poplars, there was an opening that was about 15 feet wide where the balloon's basket actually just settled and they came to a stop, but not for long because those branches couldn't hold the weight of the basket and the balloon. So they started dropping down and breaking branch by branch by branch. The balloon's envelope was starting to rip and get shredded and they just kept dropping down the trees. And when they finally came to a final stop, they were only a few feet above the ground, which was miraculous. The authorities were called and the chase drivers showed up and then they were taken away. As Emily and her family were whisked away from the crash site, she glimpsed out into the field where Brian had fallen. She could see him lying on his back and his glasses were still on his face. Seeing his position unchanged from when she'd watched him drop, she recalled his battle to hang on and then in those final moments what seemed like almost his submission. He hadn't flailed or resisted or screamed. It was almost as if he were at peace with the inevitable end that was coming. And sadly, Brian did not survive that fall. Now, did he refuse the help because he had accepted his fate? Or did he know that there was just no way they could pull him up? He was a big guy and it would have been really difficult to get him back in that basket. And he was also 72 years old and had just had heart surgery the year before. Later, the chase driver explained that Brian was meticulous with his flight preparations. His policy was to carry three strikers. He'd have a main one, a backup one, and then one that's on Velcro that's on the side of the basket that can just be ripped off. So they're not really sure what happened on that last flight of Brian's. And one of Brian's former balloon students said that he could be ruthless with them about safety, saying that he'd wrap you upside the head if you didn't have a backup igniter in your pocket. Later that year on a Saturday in mid-September, Brian's airport bustled with life. The Experimental Hot Air Balloon Festival, which was an annual thing since the 90s, and it was pro postponed in May, they were having it again in September. Canceling the event seemed like the last thing that he would have wanted, so his friends just forged ahead with it. Balloonists arrived from around the country to barbecue, visit the museum, and reminisce about their late friend. In the morning, a crowd gathered to inflate 35 of Brian's prized creations. One of the balloons showcased was called Peaches, the balloon that Brian flew during his record journey across the Alps. A longtime friend and student of Brian's helped organize the event and couldn't stop smiling as he walked around the property. He said, it's the only festival in the world where the, all the balloons come from one balloonist. Friends later commented on their good friend's death and said, Brian always had the courage and drive and perhaps the insanity to do what he loved and do what he wanted with his life. His longtime partner had said that it was his passion. He was so incredibly lucky to find something that he was really, really good at and that he really, really loved. And she's so right, everyone should be as lucky as him to have something that they're that passionate about that 50 years later, they still love it. I love dust on old things. I love old things that have rust, sort of a patina. If some moss starts growing on something, I love cobwebs. And I'll leave you with some words of Brian that really showed his childlike curiosity and sense of wonder. With all the years that I've been doing this, every now and then I look up inside the balloon and it's empty. There's nothing except it's full of magic. Thanks for watching. Cheers to Brian. Yeah, cheers. Hillary. Cheers. Oscar, Brian, nice to meet you. Jim. Hillary. Jim. Josh. Josh.